Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Uh, one, just one notice. Um, we will have a prayer meeting this week. Um, it will be by Zoom. Um, we will be focusing on prayer for churches in the association, uh, but we're just not sure which evening that's going to happen on. Um, but probably Wednesday, but we will let you know on that. As we come to uh, worship God, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. Those are, those are big promises, aren't they? The Lord delights in those who fear him. His, his, his everlasting love is with those who fear him. So it's, it, it's pretty important to understand what it means to fear the Lord. And that's going to be our theme for today. So let's uh, begin with uh, a hymn that uh, taken based there on Psalm 103. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. And we can stand and sing and uh, we are allowed to take off masks for singing. And this should be the last week that we are legally required to wear masks. sit down. Let's come to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one and only God, the only God who overflows with blessing, with goodness. You are someone who delights to give, you delight to show mercy you do not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. You're a God of, of holiness and of righteousness, and yet you're a God who delights to forgive sinners, to demonstrate your infinite love. We thank you for your compassion, your gentleness. We thank you that you know what we are like. You know that we are like dust, 
and yet you are a compassionate heavenly father. We ask, Lord, that this morning we would more deeply appreciate your greatness and glory. May we, may we gaze on your beauty, on your perfections, on all that you are. Lord, keep us from focusing on what's inside and just getting discouraged or focusing on what is around us and we just get worried. Help us rather to look up and to see you and to be overwhelmed with your goodness, to see that you are bigger than all the things that we fear. You are, you are more glorious. You are, you are good. And may we trust you and love you. May we see how majestic you are in all that makes you God, in all your holiness. And Father, we pray that that view of you would give us a a depth and a seriousness in our lives, that we would be serious about obeying you, that we would have godly courage in following you, that we would know what it is to serve you with joyfulness. And Father, we pray that everyone here would understand that you are a God that we cannot mess around with. We pray, Father, that we would not want to hide from you today. We would not want to run away because when we sense your goodness, that shows up our sin. Your light shows up our darkness. Heavenly Father, may we not try and pretend you're not there. May we not try and escape from you, but rather may we find the life, the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ. May we run to him today, we pray, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Right, fire. Um, there's no exclamation mark there, okay? That's not a um, command to evacuate. Now, I'm going to be talking a bit of later about risk-taking, and I wasn't quite sure what um, I could get away with uh, this morning in terms of creating a fire. So I thought I would um, play it safe, and uh, I thought, well, probably a candle is acceptable uh, in a building like this. So last time I tried to light something I couldn't manage to light the match so let's see let's see how we're doing wow magic <coughs> so for the benefit of uh, anyone watching on a screen there's a candle that's lit so we have fire in the building right now that's that's pretty pretty safe isn't it well, it doesn't have to be. My, my mum is uh, from Switzerland, and um, she's from a big family, and uh, she would talk about how when they were children, they would have a Christmas tree at home, and you would have real candles on the Christmas tree that would be lit. So not, you know, electric candles or something, real candles with fire on a Christmas tree. And... Um, she seemed to think this was perfectly normal and sensible. Uh, it never caused any problems in their, like I say, big family. Uh, she wanted to try it at home. And um, this, this was done. The candles were lit. Uh, my dad was next to the tree with a fire extinguisher looking very worried. Um, and I must admit, on this one, I think I would actually uh, be siding with my dad. Um, if you uh, get a Christmas tree... And you put, I'm not going to do this, you'll be pleased to know, but um, I could have shown you a picture of doing this in the garden, but this burns pretty quickly. Um, it would be a pretty scary inferno. So you would start from a nice pretty candle and you would soon have uh, an inferno if something went wrong. So this fire can be something beautiful. You use it to decorate the tree, but it's also something that can be terrifying. Or think of um, bonfire night, or bonfire night as it used to be. Uh, when I was young, which is even longer ago now than it used to be, um, 
ha Halloween wasn't such a big thing. And uh, the, the, the main event at that time of year was actually knocking on doors, not trick-or-treating, but asking for furniture. Basically, anything that would burn. So you would, you would go around the neighborhood collecting any sort of wood, anything that would burn, and you would create a giant bonfire. I mean, you would sometimes have, you know, bonfires that were, well, not quite as tall as this room, maybe, but, um, you know, big, big, big bonfires, and you would light those on November the 5th along with uh, fireworks, a bit more danger there. People would be lighting those, you know, by hand rather than all these electronic displays. But when you have one of these, these big bonfires, it was always really exciting. You, you'd get all the light from the bonfire. It would light up the darkness. You'd get all the heat, which was handy, because before global warming, nights were cold on bonfire night. And, um, you know, it was actually nice to feel the heat of the bonfire. But boy, if you got too close to it, once it was really going, you wanted to step back. This was something a bit scary. So it was something wonderful and also rather scary and dangerous. And look at this. God says, the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He's not literally a fire, but he's saying, I'm like a fire in certain ways. When God appears to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, there's, there's flame everywhere, there's fire. When God appears to Moses, it's in a burning bush. And I think this is a wonderful picture to convey something incredible about God, that he's someone that we can't control and contain. If you try and sort of, if you try and contain this, you try and put this in a container, it will go out. You can't contain uh, God. He's someone that gives light, gives heat. There's, there's a beauty in fire, isn't there? Um, I, I love open fires in, in houses. There's nothing, it, you, you can sort of stare at a fire for ages, can't you? There's always something sort of fresh about it. There's a beauty in fire. But you can't mess with it. If you mess with it, you're in real danger. And so there's this sort of twin picture of God. God is someone incredibly attractive and someone very scary. He's sort of awesome in his wonderfulness. You can always put it like this. Fire is never boring. And that's also true of God. I think one of the, the biggest errors we make as Christians is somehow or other, I don't know how we manage this, we manage to make God appear boring, which is the most ridiculous thing ever. Fire isn't boring, and neither is God. He is someone who is utterly wonderful, but he's someone you want, actually, to be close to. And that's going to be the theme of our... Uh, our message later. So let's, let me get rid of this before something goes wrong. Um, and um, we're going to sing. Um, this time, um, it's a different way God is described, okay? So God describes himself in lots of different ways because God is everything. God, you know, God, God is uh, sort of infinite. So you, you, you need lots of different things to describe uh, what God is like. Ascribe greatness to God the rock, this is also words coming from, from Deuteronomy. So here you've got the idea that God is a, is, a, is a safe place to stand. But of course, he's also terrifying. A rock is terrifying if it lands on you. So again, you want to be on the right side of God. So let's, let's stand and sing this, uh, this little chorus together. We'll sing this through two times.
please sit down. We're going to come to our, our reading now, and um, just I don't think anyone's got any of these yet, but there's a, a sort of summary sheet for the message this morning. Don't, don't panic uh, looking at this. Uh, we're not sort of doing everything on here. We're going to be, rather than just looking at the passage we're reading, we're going to looking at all sorts of different uh, verses from Scripture. So rather than you sort of trying to scrabble all of these down, I thought if I put them on a bit of paper, you can focus on what we're saying. And uh, we can maybe hand those... Um, well, you must as well hand those out now, yeah? Um, if people want those. And as we read Deuteronomy chapter 6, we are really reading a very wonderful summary of what it means to follow God. It's actually a passage that Jesus quotes from twice when he is tempted by Satan. So Jesus obviously saw this as something of a model of what it means to follow God. So as we read this passage, uh, maybe you can um, look out for how many times it tells us to fear the Lord. So, Deuteronomy 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you, to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massah. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you, and you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and the laws that the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt. But the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and to give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. So how many times did we find the fear of the Lord there? Any ideas? Guess some numbers, yeah? Uh, Yeah, I think it was three. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was three times. And... um, Something that will um, really help us on this subject, um, 
if you if you read um, well, there's this. These, these two books by, by Mike Reeves, um, Rejoice and Tremble, and then basically what is the same book but just shortened, uh, What Does It Mean to Fear the Lord? Um, I don't normally tell you where I um, get all my ideas from, but if you read these books, you will see uh, how much I've stolen for today's message. The, 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 this is an incredibly helpful book to understand this subject and to go into this uh, in more depth, and it's, it's not about understanding a subject, it's about how we know our God. And uh, you'll find, and if you, you don't want to read the long thing, this, this short thing won't take you very long to get through. So um, I really commend those to you, and I've written those on the sheet. We'll come to, to prayer again in a moment. Um, just a reminder of a couple of events coming up. Um, if you're a man, um, there's a conference here. Uh, that the women had one in, in uh, October, I think. Uh, but on the 5th of March, um, in, uh, this one's in... Hang on, this is in Chatham, isn't it? Um, Standing Firm in Christ. Uh, Rob Pickering uh, from Selhurst uh, Evangelical Church, near where I, uh, the church I went to when I, it was near that, that church I went to when I was uh, growing up. And um, that's on Saturday the 5th of March. Um, I, I commend that to you. And also if you are uh, between ages 15 and 25, whether you're a man or a woman, um, there's a day conference, Save to Serve, um, you'll notice, uh, speak to Adam and Julia about this one. Um, this time, it's a, it's a one-day conference, so it's, it makes it even easier to get to. That's not going to take out uh, much time out of your schedule, uh, but it's going to be a great opportunity to get young people together and to learn uh, about Christian commitment and character, um, very much in tune with what we're looking at this morning. So that's Saturday the 26th of March. And I just love that name, Saved to Serve. Um, that's what it means to be a Christian. And we had the, the Christian Institute here on Wednesday, um, talking about some of the challenges uh, for, for Christians today. Uh, one of the things they were talking about is the uh, proposed ban on so-called conversion therapy. Um, there's some leaflets about this and ways that you can respond to a government consultation that's still going on on this. Um, you know, if no one says anything, then why should the government think that anyone's got a problem with it? So the more people actually say something, they might register. There's some, some difficulties, I think, with what is being proposed. Um, so that is all explained for you on those leaflets which are on the table by the door. But I thought as we, um, you know, are aware of these things, let's... Let's take the, a, a moment to pray for Christians, if you like, who really are in danger at the moment uh, in a far greater way than we are. Um, I, I read this week that Afghanistan now outranks North Korea as the most dangerous place to be a Christian. That's quite a scary thought, isn't it, from what you know of North Korea. Afghanistan, it's even more dangerous to be a Christian. So let's pray for our brothers and sisters there. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have grown that church in Afghanistan. A few decades ago, there would barely be a handful of Christians in the whole country. But we thank you that the church there has grown to many thousands. And we ask, Lord, that you would help your people now. We pray that you would provide for them in the dangers and the needs that they are in at the moment. We pray, Father, that you would provide for their basic needs, where maybe people have lost access to work because of their faith. Others where the person that would earn the money is maybe in prison or being killed where people are mourning the loss of children, parents, siblings. We pray, Father, that in the midst of all of that, they would be utterly certain that you are there with your people, that when anyone touches your people, um, it is Jesus they are persecuting. And we pray, Father, that you would give them a deep confidence of the hope that they have in the Lord Jesus. We pray, Father, that as others suffer around them, that that witness would shine all the brighter as they are able to offer real hope in this situation, hope that is founded in you. And we pray, Lord, give them wisdom in knowing how to 
negotiate their lives at this time, whether it is right for them to flee or whether it is right for them to stay. Help them, we pray. And we pray, Father, for, um, for, for whatever church structure still exists, for, for teaching in churches. We pray that you would guard your people from false teaching. We pray that you would protect them. And we ask, Lord, that in your great mercy and providence, that you would yet overturn uh, the, the oppression that they face. We pray, Father, that even through their witness, many people in the government would be turned around and would come to trust in you. Heavenly Father, be merciful to your people there in Afghanistan and indeed in many other parts of this world where they suffer greatly because they follow you. And as we remember our persecuted brethren, we pray that you would help us here. It's easy to imagine that um, we would show courage in such situations, but in a sense, the test of that is what we do in lesser situations. We pray, Father, that we would have more backbone in our Christian witness and obedience to you. Lord, help us when we're laughed at at school. Help us when we face obstacles at work because we trust you. Help us, Father, maybe in our homes where there's a division because of the gospel. We pray, Father, that you would help us to do what is right, to do what pleases you, even when it's costly. And, Father, we ask that you would prepare us for whatever is to come, that we might be faithful to you and follow you with the sort of seriousness and zeal that uh, is worthy of such a great Saviour. So help us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing once more, um, The Lord's My Shepherd, obviously based on Psalm 23. I do wonder if we sometimes uh, miss, mishear this, you know, here's a, here's a nice, nice gentle psalm. Um, shepherds are not softies, they're tough people. And in fact, if you're a sheep, the last thing you want is some sort of namby-pamby sort of person. If you're, if, you're, if you're a sheep, you want, you want someone that's going to be bigger than the wolf, don't you? you? You want someone actually pretty scary who's going to be able to protect you. And in a way, this is what this psalm is telling us. This, this is who our God is. Um, there's no one bigger than him. And that's why it's a wonderful thing that he is my shepherd. Let's stand and sing.
Well, we've never been safer, yet never more afraid. We are healthier, we live longer, child mortality is very low, diseases that were incurable in the past are now treatable, and yet it seems when we, we've never been more anxious about our health. We've never been more able to protect from dangers in the environment, and yet we fear environmental catastrophe. Or think of something like insurance. You know, insurance is meant to reassure, isn't it? You know, it's meant to give you cover in case something goes wrong. Well, the trouble is you then start worrying about whether you've got the right insurance. Am I covered? Uh, I remember a few years ago, I, I was trying to renew our car insurance, and they came up with all these sort of other questions and options, saying, you know, do you, do you want to have key theft insurance? You know, do you want to have insurance for misfueling? And I thought, oh, help, I never thought of that. Um, you know, oh, maybe I should do this. And then you sort of panic every time you go to the petrol station because you think, oh, I never got that extra insurance. Maybe I should have done. And it can actually almost aggravate your fears. Why are we, it seems, so much more risk-averse as a society, when we've never been safer? Well, I want to suggest that it's because we've lost something of the fear of God. I want to, um, this week, focus on on what, what we mean by that. Next week, to think how this is the answer to anxiety. One of the points that Mike Reeves makes in that book um, is that uh, the sort of atheists promised us that if we sort of get rid of all this religious stuff, it will liberate us from all our fears. But I think what has happened is the exact opposite. As we've ceased to fear God, our fears have multiplied. And fear is something so powerful, isn't it? It's perhaps the most powerful human emotion. It's something that drives our choices. What we fear tells us what we really value. Politicians know this. You know, we had Project Fear, didn't we, to try and get us to vote a certain way. Think of the decisions that depend on fear. If your your house is on fire, what do you save? Will you go in and try and rescue your child because you fear their loss more than the fire? It's very telling. And fear is complex, isn't it? On the one hand, we recoil from fears. We don't like fears, and yet we're also fascinated by fear. You know, the excitement of something like a roller coaster, at least for some people, not me, um, is precisely because it is sort of scary. That, that's sort of the whole point. Or, you know, something like Doctor Who or something that, that perhaps is actually scary on the telly. Um, You know, this sort of idea of hiding behind the sofa, but still watching it. It's this sort of strange, you're sort of trying to avoid it, and yet you're drawn to it. So how on earth do we then understand the fear of God? This sort of complexity of fear. Well, as you start to read the Bible, in a way your confusion increases. Take this, look at what Mary said. His, his, his God, God's mercy extends to those who fear him. And yet Zechariah in the same chapter says <coughs> that God has enabled us to serve him without fear. You know, is this uh, an application of the Christmas Day sermon on feminism? You know, is, is, is Mary right or is, uh, um, is, Zechar- you know, is Zechariah wrong? Well, what about at Mount Sinai? The people see all these, this incredible sort of, um, the the fire, the thunder, the lightning, the trumpet, the smoke, and it says they trembled with fear, and then Moses says to the people, don't be afraid, you need to have the fear of God. You think, what's going on? Samuel tells the people, don't be afraid, but be sure to fear the Lord. And then what about this? John the disciple, verse that's often quoted, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. But what about Jesus? 
this prophecy from Isaiah is talking about the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus, and it describes the Spirit of the Lord resting on him. And look what it says there at the end. He will have a spirit of the fear of the Lord. And even more than that, he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Now, Jesus is someone perfect in love, and yet there is fear here. What is going on? Well, actually, understanding this is one of the most basic things in the Christian life. If it's something we don't understand, we've actually got a lot of maturing to do. It's something that Christians down the ages, I think, have instinctively understood. You, ca- you, catch, it in, um, you catch it in hymns. John Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace. God's grace first taught my heart to fear. His grace my fears relieved. Do you see that? He, that there's fear, and yet his fears relieved. How on earth can we make sense of this? Well, there's two kinds of relationship with God. One is characterized by a sinful fear. This is where you're afraid of God such that you run away. You try and get as far away from God as you can, or just pretend he's not there. The sort of thing we see right at the beginning of the Bible with Adam and Eve. What do they do? They hear the sound of the Lord God in the garden and they hide. And Adam actually says, I was afraid of you. And in a sense, it's a right reaction. Because sin, disobeying God, places us under God's wrath, his righteous anger. We've got every reason to be scared. That's why demons tremble, scared witless before God. In a sense, it's a right reaction, but a wrong response. It's a wrong response to God as a person because it's not the sort of relationship we were made for with God. Sinful fear is based on a false view of God. It's a bit like the man in the, one of the parables, Jesus says, where, where he describes his master and says, I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. And that is how we, in our sinfulness, think of God. God is someone mean and harsh not someone good and overflowing in mercy. And so as a result, we can respond in hatred of God. People like Christopher Hitchens sort of just said that, you know, serving God would be like living in a celestial North Korea. There's that sort of hatred of God. But it can also actually be manifest in religious duty, where you actually can seek to obey God, but out of fear not out of love, there's no warmth, but it's simply out of fear of punishment. There's no desire to be near God, rather you're trying to obey God to keep God at a distance. You know, do just enough to keep God away. And those sinful fear responses, in the end, they lead to hell. And in fact, are a horrible, that sort of fear is actually a horrible foretaste of the experience of hell. So this sinful fear, it cripples you, it drains you, it sucks life out of you. It's the complete opposite of the sort of energizing, life-giving fear that comes from knowing God truly. This right fear. And here the fear is not so much about God's presence, it's his absence. Here God's awesome glory makes you want to run to him you realize you are safe when you are close to God. It's a bit like um, with a hurricane. You know, the safest place to be in a hurricane is right at the center. If you're right at the center, at the eye of the storm, everything is calm. The air is still. It's a bit like that with God. In a way, you're you're safest when you're close to him. There's another lovely picture of this. Um, one of my favorite characters in the Bible is Obed-Edom. People, um, people were terrified of the Ark of God because someone had died after touching it. And Obed-Edom has the Ark representing God's presence in his house. And it says he was blessed. He brought God right into his house and discovered that's actually how he was blessed. That's the right sort of fear. 
So it's, it's not being afraid of God, but being overwhelmed by God, in particular, of his grace. Look at this, Psalm 130. With you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. This is like the sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet. She was overwhelmed by the forgiveness that she had experienced. Well, Jeremiah 33. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity I provide for the city. Here, the fear is a sort of jaw-dropping, um, God's sort of jaw-dropping goodness, an awe at that. You just can't get over it. It's a joyful fear in the face of God's wonderful works. You know that Lego song, Everything is Awesome? Well, with God, everything really is awesome in the English, not American sense, where you get an awesome hamburger. Um, you know, this, the, with God, everything truly is awesome. And so there's a, there's a, a joyfulness in this fear. It's like when the, the widow of Nain's son was raised from the dead. It talks about the people being filled with fear. It was a joyful fear as they see that man brought back to life. Or the fear and joy you find in the women at the resurrection, when they see Jesus raised from the dead, that it's described them having this combination of fear and joy. It's the sort of fear that makes your heart sing. It's a delight in God. In other words, fear is another way of talking about love for God. Fear is not the opposite to love. We had it uh, in actually the reading in Deuteronomy 6, but you also get it here in Deuteronomy 10. What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord, to walk in his ways, to love him? Those aren't some things in sort of opposition to each other. They're all part of the same thing. Fear and love are almost interchangeable in the Bible's vocabulary. So it is love for God, not fear of punishment, that drives obedience. You love to live under God's smile. His, his delight is what delights you. And this sort of God-fearing love is what is appropriate for God. You see, love for God is different to sort of saying, oh, I'm loving this pizza. Or, or even, you know, for some, oh, I love my dog. It's something a bit different to that, isn't it? Because God is a bit different. Our love for God is not something trite or fluffy or limp. Rather, it is a love that is weighty, serious, substantial, deep, lasting. And that's what's so good about this word fear. Fear puts backbone into our love for God. It's communicating something of the depth of this relationship that is like no other, a sort of depth and intensity. And I think that is the clue as to why we call it fear. Because you might sort of think, well, isn't it all a bit confusing using this word fear? You know, this idea that there's a right fear and a wrong fear. You know, it's not about being afraid of God in that sense. You know, isn't it all just a bit confusing? Well, it's the word that God has chosen and it's a brilliant word to use. See, the word fear has a sort of edge to it. There's a sharpness to it that is exactly right when we're talking about God. It's a bit like uh, in C.S. Lewis's Narnia, you know, where the children, the children ask, is Aslan safe? you know, the, the great lion, is he safe? And they get the reply, well, of course he's not safe. That's the whole point. That's precisely why he's someone worth knowing. And I think this is why using the word reverence or respect to explain the fear of God is not terribly helpful, at least in the sort of connotation those words have for us today, I think. You see, to talk about reverence, it's all a bit grey and tepid, stuffy, 
insipid. It's a bit sort of stained glass window. It's a bit distant and, quite frankly, a bit boring. You don't get an adrenaline rush with reverence. You know, it's a bit like being at school and you're told, you know, not to pick your nose when the visiting dignitary comes along. You know, yawn. How boring. God isn't some visiting dignitary. He's a raging volcano. That's, that's the sort of picture we have of God. God isn't dull. And as I said before, I think the g- greatest failing of a preacher and a parent, and I speak as both, is to make God seem boring, to make following God seem boring. I think that's almost unforgivable. How on earth can we make the God of this universe seem dull? And yet, in our sinfulness, we somehow manage it. This word fear captures something of the intensity of the experience of knowing God, the idea of being overwhelmed, because fear is a deep response. You know, it triggers a physical response in us, doesn't it? Fear gets your adrenaline pumping, your heart racing, your knees can go weak. And the thing is, you get that in all types of fear. You can get that, yes, in the face of a tsunami wave, the excitement of a roller coaster, but also something like falling in love. You can be sort of dumbstruck before someone in the face of beauty or whatever. You're driven to, uh, to great things out of this. A, it's a deep, deep reaction. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not simply emotion. That can come and go, according to what we've eaten, almost. I'm talking about a, a change at the core of our being that does actually affect us, that changes us all over. That's, that's what fear does. So it changes our deepest desires. So yes, you love someone and you are ready to, to almost uproot everything and start a new life. Travel all the way around the world, maybe, so that you can be with them. What would almost be seen as extreme things, and yet that's the sort of reaction. That's, that's, that's what we're getting at when we talk about fear. Fear of God is the sort of heartbeat of the Christian life that is to shape our whole life, it's to drive action. The great thing about fear is that it's not passive. It drives action. And so this sort of joyful, energizing fear is to be our total response to God, our total response to God in all of his glory, in all of his goodness and wisdom and holiness, forgiveness and justice, all that he is, is to describe our whole reaction to him. So how's this actually going to be seen in, in life? What's, what's the fruit of fear? Let me just give you a few examples here. Knowledge, first of all. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <clears throat> Adam and Eve wanted knowledge without the fear of God. And what did it result in for them? More anxiety. For us, knowledge often brings anxiety. You know, the more you know about everything that's going on in the world, all the dangers in the world, the more fearful we become. All the sort of news apps can just add to our anxiety. There's more things to worry about. Or Dr. Google. You know, the more you read up about uh, illnesses you could possibly have or that you might get if you eat the wrong food or whatever, um, the more you read up about symptoms, the more ill you feel. It gives us knowledge of things, actually, in the end, we can't control. Whereas fearing God brings knowledge of God. And that is something that really is helpful. Because he is the one who is in control. If you like, it's knowledge of reality. The whole point about the fear of God is that it's it's getting real about the way the world actually is. You see, to try and explain everything without God would be like trying to explain the solar system without the sun. You know, there's all these planets and everything else moving around, but that makes no sense unless there's a sun at the centre. And it's the same with our lives. What What does everything orbit around? Ultimately, it's God. 
So if we know God, we know ourselves. We know our place in the universe in relation to him. We know that he is at the centre, that he is the one that matters most. We order our lives around him, around him. If you like, the fear of God is saying that God is big on our horizon. He's, he's the one that is just always there, always at the forefront. He's not a sort of afterthought. He's at the forefront of everything in our lives. And that leads to wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's very practical. It's about how we live, how we negotiate the complexity of life. The fear of God is our compass. And again, you see, if we don't fear God, we're ignoring reality. We're trying to live in a world that doesn't exist. It's a bit like trying to cross a room with a giant elephant in it and pretending the elephant isn't there. You're going to keep hitting the elephant. It's it's, it's not going to work. You're going to be frustrated. And if you try and live your life as if God is not there you're out of tune with reality. That isn't going to be a life of wisdom. Here's another fruit of fear. Risk-taking, joyful obedience. Let me give you this example. Obadiah, he worked for King Ahab. He feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel, that's Ahab's wife, cut off the prophets of the Lord, that means she killed them, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And I could have taken all sorts of other examples from the Bible, but I I love this one of Obadiah. Do you see what the fear of God does here? Unlike other fear, the fear of God energizes It gives strength. It gives courage. It took some courage for Obadiah to do that. It was costly for Obadiah to do that. Now, I wonder if we asked people in Gravesend or around the country, people that knew real Christians, if we asked them for sort of words that described the lives of those Christians they knew, I wonder if risk-taking would be one of the words that they use. Would people ever think of Christians and immediately think risk-takers? Well, I think actually that's wrong. You read the Bible, it's full of risk-takers. If you were a Christian in Afghanistan, you'd be a risk-taker. That's actually the normal Christian life. I said there's an edge to the word fear. Well, is there an edge to our obedience? Or do we step back and say, well, it's a bit risky. Don't know what might happen. I'd just rather just be comfortable, have my nice, comfortable life, because that's what God's promised for me, isn't it? Sorry, it isn't. What do we trust in for our safety? Um, last year, we, we were distributing um, those books by, by Jeremy Marshall talking about his experience of facing terminal cancer, trusting God in that experience. Well, he was brought up. Um, his dad was, uh, was, was John Marshall. And as a family, they would spend their family holidays driving across to Eastern Europe smuggling Bibles and visiting persecuted Christians in Eastern Europe. Imagine that as a family holiday. I don't think it would be boring, but you might say a bit risky. Will the kids be safe? Or what about the things that uh, we will put our effort into and study? Sometimes um, Christian parents in particular say, oh, I don't want my kids studying that. You know, that, that's, that's a bit risky. But, you know, we need Christians who are suitably gifted to be studying subjects that are hard, subjects that will, will, where your faith is attacked. We need Christians who understand things like queer theory, who understand fossils. Oh, it's a bit risky. But we need it. 
Or would you take the risk to care for someone where no one notices, no one thanks you, no one writes a blog about you, no one gives you any recognition, but you do it simply because you know the smile of God? Would you take that risk in your life? How many more examples could we give? You know, becoming a Christian is to give God a blank check for your life. That's risky, but it's what it means to be a Christian. Worship. We have worship in the new creation. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? All, all nations will come and worship before you. If we fear God, we will know how beautifully awesome our God is overflowing with goodness. And it means we will make sure we organize our lives. This is what I mean about God being at the forefront. We will organize our lives for the one hour out of the 168 in the week where we can gather together and worship him. You know, put it like this, it's unthinkable, surely, to be late for something so wonderful. We're effectively saying God doesn't matter very much. We don't really care about worshipping him. He's not that wonderful. Why should I bother to rearrange my life, get up a bit earlier, or whatever it takes, so that I can be here and make the most of every opportunity to be with God's people? You see, if you fear God, you can't be casual about worshipping him. Prayer. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. Wow. Do we believe that? If we believe that... We would pray. The church I grew up in, there was, um, there was a man who had a family with, with quite a number of children. He, he worked in, I think, in the home office in London. He had a sort of um, job as a sort of a porter, a doorman there. And they didn't have much money. He wasn't paid very well for that. So he would cycle to work. I'm not sure exactly the distance, but probably 10, 12 miles or so from Thornton Heath to London. And he would cycle home again from work. And on a Monday night, he would cycle back. It would take a while, obviously, to cycle back, working late. Monday night, it was the prayer meeting night. So he would go home, he would grab some sandwiches, and he would be straight back out down to the prayer meeting. Why? Because he believed his heavenly father had something good to give him. So he's going to come and ask. If you truly believe that, you're going to come and ask, aren't you? And you're, you're not going to be put off by, by other things. You're going to be single-minded about this if you truly fear God. If God is truly big on your horizon. Well, I don't know about you, but um, in the light of this, as I've been thinking about this week, my Christian life feels rather pathetic and tepid and wet, really compared to what we see in some of these examples in Scripture and indeed down history. I need to grow in the fear of God. I need a bit more backbone in my service of God and my love for him. So just very quickly, how do we grow in this fear? Well, the mistake is just to go for something external, you know, there's not enough, not enough fear of God. There's not enough reverence. We need more suits and solemnity. That doesn't cut it, I'm afraid. It's not a technique. It's not something merely outward. There's not some nice little set of steps we can do, and it all magically appears, because the fear of God is ultimately about knowing God. It's an encounter with God. You need to get close to God. One of the mistakes we make is you, you can't admire God from a distance, If you want to see his goodness, you need to get close. And one of the ways we do that is to start, or we do do that by starting with Scripture. All of it. As you read through Scripture, you'll discover there's an awful lot about fearing God. I wonder, had had you heard of Obadiah and Obed-Edom before? There's actually two Obadiahs in the Bible. Did you know that? Well, we should know that. If this is God's word, if we think this is God has spoken to us here, we can manage to read blog posts, all sorts of things on our phones. Can we not manage to read through the whole of the Bible 
and do that again and again and again? Is that really such a big deal? This is God's word. He's the one we fear. And we need God's word to soak into our life. To shape our life. That God is real to us in the daily issues of life. And it's actually as we, as we obey God that we experience more of God. We, he becomes more real to us. It's one of these things, again, you can't do from the outside. You have to surrender your life to God, and then you discover he's very real. You need to take that risk. And I love the way this is put there in the reading we had earlier. The, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts impress them on your children. This is about our daily life. You know, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. I mean, in effect, it's, it's make God's word like your phone. You know, think how many times you tap on your phone for something. Well, make sure you tap on God's word just as much. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. part of everyday normal life. And as you do that, you will see God in a different way. He'll even alter how you view the world around you. Um, Lovely quote from Spurgeon, how he would delight in thunderstorms. He would go out in the midst of thunderstorms, he was a risk taker, um, because he said, I love to hear my heavenly father's voice in the thunder. So when he sees a thunderstorm, he doesn't think, well, that's a thunderstorm. Think about all the physics of it. It's, this is part of God's creation. This is, this is, in a sense, God speaking. This is my heavenly father's voice. And boy, it's scary, but isn't it wonderful that this is my heavenly father that's behind the thunder and behind everything. You see, nothing's ordinary when you fear God. We need to share that experience of God together. Those who feared the Lord talked with each other. This is something we do together. You don't just do it on a pillar on your own. You don't just sit up on a pillar in the middle of nowhere. You have to do this as part of the community of God's people. That is how we grow in the fear of the Lord. But can I finish with this? The way we learn to fear God at the deepest level is at the cross. You see, God's glory is seen supremely in his grace to sinners. God's glory is his goodness. The cross is where we first learn to fear God. Remember those words from the hymn Amazing Grace? "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." And that explains something you may be wondering about, which is the title of the sermon. Don't you fear God? Who said that? It was the thief, or really the murderer, that was crucified next to Jesus. Right at the end of his life, will you listen to the words of a dying man? He was probably closer to Jesus than anyone else. As he got close to Jesus, even Jesus dying on a cross, he sees God's glory. He sees God's goodness. He discovers that with God there is forgiveness, that he may be feared. What about you? Will you get close enough to God to see his goodness. Will you take that risk? It's never too late to fear God. And may he help us to do that. So let's do that final point in our final song. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count as loss and pour contempt on all my pride. You see what's going on here? In the light of the cross, in the light of God's grace, his kindness, his goodness to sinners, my richest gain, you know, what would that be? The best career you could imagine, the best marriage partner, the most amount of money, 
Whatever it might be, my richest gain I count as loss compared to the goodness that is found in Christ. Let's stand and sing. Please sit down. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you woo us with love. We thank you that ultimately what drives us to you is not the, that, that sort of fear of your awesome holiness. It is the incredible depth of love that we see displayed to sinners on the cross. We thank you that that is your heartbeat. We thank you that you're a God overflowing with goodness. And we pray, Father, dispel every lie in our heads about what you are like. Dispel every lie that Satan loves to perpetuate about who you are. And may we get real that of who you really are, how awesome you are, how majestic, and how gracious. Lord, help us to at least begin to follow you in a way that is, that is worthy of you, that reflects something of your own glory. Lord, help us as your people. Forgive us for our failings. Forgive us for how much we get wrong, how, how tepid our, our service of you really is. And keep us, Father, from trying to sort of work our way into acceptance. Lord, we're never accepted through how well we obey. Help us not to think somehow we can earn your love through working harder, but rather may we be, as we are overwhelmed by the love you have already shown to us, may that truly drive the, the obedience, the joyful obedience that, um, that, you, that is worthy of you. So, Lord, help us as your people. Help us, Father, to 
display the, the something of Christ in our lives, for we ask it in his name. Amen.